When it comes to building and widening freeways, the term induced demand gets thrown around a lot. And it can be a bit ambiguous, so today we're gonna peel the layers of that onion. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Topic suggestions always welcome, and I don't know if this was literally a topic suggestion, but it's something that's been hinted at in a lot of the comments I get. Here's an example from viewer get the pitchforks, all one word, triple exclamation point. I don't know if you've done a video on how adding more lanes on a freeway leads to more congestion in a short couple of years. There's a fight going on concerning I-45 North in Houston, Texas. I don't live near there. I just want the city to spend more money on a combo park and ride slash rail instead. Keep the cars out of the city. I have bad news for you, get the pitchforks. Orthodox urbanist teachings require you to be anti-park and ride too. So I suggest you go back and review the catechisms. What you're talking about though is what you often hear called induced demand. It's a shorthand term people use to express the idea that when you widen a roadway, the increased capacity attracts more vehicles. My experience is the term induced demand just doesn't really connect and I don't think it helps make the argument you wanna make. And I think it's because it's a term that can be interpreted a lot of different ways and probably not always in the way that you hope. The point you're usually trying to get across is that widening highways is futile because you just attract more traffic and you eventually reach the same level of congestion again. But what they're hearing is that adding capacity accommodates more travel, more opportunity, and more economic activity. So what I want to do today is dive into some ideas around induced demand demand, add some nuance, and share some information that I hope will help you think a little more clearly and more deeply about the issue so that you can be understood better and have a better chance at making a difference in your community. First, let's define some terms. I'm really not trying to be pedantic here. It's just the induced demand is kind of an oxymoron. The demand either exists or it doesn't. So apologies to those of you who have been through basic microeconomics, but in a basic supply demand curve, demand isn't a single point. It's a continuum. It manifests as fewer customers when supply is low and prices are high, and it manifests as more customers when supply is high and prices are lower. And in the case of roadway facilities, the price we're talking about isn't so much monetary, but really the time cost of travel. So adding, say, a lane of freeway shifts that supply curve. The demand curve stays the same, people still have the same willingness to pay at different price points. But because the supply curve shifts, you reach a new economic equilibrium that serves more customers, but at a lower price point. And that, in a nutshell, is the entire rationale for roadway capacity projects. You're serving more customers, but with less average delay. So the big question here is, this delta in the number of customers, where does it come from? And the answer is worth talking about in some depth, because it really helps tease out the things that are truly objectionable in roadway widening projects, and it helps explain why analyzing them is so difficult. When we talk about the traffic that materializes after we add a new lane, it really takes place across five dimensions. One, traffic that was previously using a different route. Two, travelers who were previously using different modes, usually transit. Three, traffic that was previously traveling at a different, less preferred time of day. Four, new or longer trips that didn't previously pencil out economically. And five, in the longer term, additional traffic from new development, or sprawl if you must, that wouldn't have occurred if the roadway hadn't expanded. To me, the key is how well our methods of analysis pick up on these five different sources of induced traffic. So let's talk about something that definitely provides one of the most important justifications for any capacity project and that's the travel demand model. A travel demand model is a mathematical representation of a metropolitan region's transportation network. Their networks usually include all roadways other than local neighborhood streets, some level of transit network, and underlying land use, which is organized into what we call transportation analysis zones, or TAZs, which contain population and employment attributes that generate trips that get loaded onto the network. 
Models can be used to analyze different time slices, most commonly a PM peak hour. And these are usually what we call four step models. And it's worth talking through the four steps because it goes to the heart of how induced traffic is or isn't captured in our analysis. The four steps are number one, trip generation. How many trip origins and destinations are being generated by each TAZ? Number two, trip distribution, which determines which TAZs to pair for the origins and destinations of each trip. Number three, mode choice, which estimates whether each trip will be made by single occupant vehicle, multiple occupant, transit, etc. And four, trip assignment, which uses an iterative process to assign vehicle trips to different routes until the model reaches some sort of network travel time equilibrium. Okay, now let's look at a super simplified example of a capacity project where you might expect induced traffic effects and where you'd probably apply a travel demand model. The setup is we're adding a fourth lane to a three mile segment of freeway. There are a variety of parallel routes but the key one is an arterial that runs just a few blocks from the freeway. The arterial has two through lanes in each direction and it has a light rail line running down the median. Let's talk capacity. We're gonna say the freeway lanes run about 1800 vehicles per hour and the arterial runs at 1200 per lane per hour. And let's say the existing condition is that both roadways run at about 90% capacity in the peak hour. In traffic engineering, we call that a volume capacity ratio or VC ratio of 0.9. So let's start with the most basic, most useless kind of analysis, which is not running a model and just assuming no changes to traffic patterns at all. This should never happen, but you will see it if a dot is completely venal and thinks they can get away with it. And really, this is what you wish would happen when you added a fourth lane. The existing traffic would just spread out into the extra lane and you'd get a nice low VC ratio of 0.68. That's not how any of this works though. Now let's look at how well our travel demand model captures the five different ways traffic can be induced. The easiest one is where traffic reroutes to take advantage of the new capacity. And the model handles this pretty well. For this, you would rerun the trip assignment step. You'd increase the link capacity from 5,400 to 7,200 and rerun the assignment. An actual model is much more complex but let's just say this one only aims for VC ratio equilibrium. So it shows about 400 cars electing to reroute onto the freeway. Now both the arterial and the freeway have a VC ratio of 0.73. Let's see how the model handles a second type of traffic induction, which is people shifting away from transit and into their cars. You can go one step further back in the model's four step process and rerun the mode choice. Travel demand models for US cities usually don't show big changes at this step. There has to be fast, frequent transit service and a pretty congested network for transit to even move the needle. So I'd say most of the time, you won't even see this done as part of the analysis. But let's say our model shifts 100 people off of light rail into SOVs and onto the freeway. Now our third source of induced traffic, people shifting their travel times. If you only have a PM peak hour model, you're simply not gonna capture this at all. The region I work with most frequently, Portland Metro, does have what they call a peak spreading model, which I believe generates separate trip tables for every hour between like 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. and can reallocate demand across those hours based on land use and network changes. Most regions don't have a model like this, but let's say in this case we do. And it tells us that 200 vehicles that were previously traveling at off-peak times are induced to use the new peak hour capacity. Our fourth potential source of induced traffic is new and longer trips. You can try to analyze this with a model by peeling it back to the second step trip distribution, which does use feedback from the network to inform the attraction between different origins and destinations. I don't feel like models are great at doing this, but let's say our model reallocates trips due to the new capacity being offered and 200 more vehicles show up on our three mile segment that were previously making different or shorter trips. And the last source of induced traffic, long-term changes in land use to take advantage of new capacity. In theory, the model can capture this using its 
20 to 30 year forecast trip table. But in reality, reallocating land use in a regional model is a super political, multi-jurisdiction process. And you're usually not gonna wade into this at the project level. So I'm not gonna touch this because I really only wanna talk about immediate traffic induction impacts anyway. So this was just an example, but you can imagine that the results are gonna vary based on a lot of factors, how congested parallel routes are, how congested the shoulder hours are, whether there's high capacity transit. But on the macro level, there's been a lot of research into the relationship between added lane miles and added vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. And the research generally gives a short-term elasticity between 0.3 and 0.6, which means if you increase capacity by 33%, like we've done here, you should expect an increase in vehicle volumes of 10 to 20 percent, which is about what I put into our example. I'll leave some citations down in the description. What it means though, at least theoretically, is that you've got more traffic volume, but less traffic congestion. And this would be consistent with that supply and demand chart we looked at earlier, where shifting the supply curve meant you had more customers, i.e. traffic volume, and they were paying a lower price, i.e. less average delay. Keep in mind though, even an extremely complex regional travel demand model is a simplified representation of actual traffic dynamics. In the real world, traffic is way more complicated. Nothing in the transportation system happens in a vacuum, and there are always upstream and downstream effects that are really hard to pin down. Your 33% theoretical capacity increase is almost certainly gonna be lower because there's a pinch point upstream that won't allow the new capacity to be fully utilized, or there's a hidden bottleneck downstream that only gets revealed when you pour 33% more traffic into it. And that's really the big problem with capacity projects. It never ends. You're always creating or discovering some new bottleneck that needs to be quote unquote fixed. The bottom line is the bigger and more complicated the project, the more uncertainty there is in the analysis. And my experience is the analysis almost always overstates the benefits of the project. And there are some very cynical explanations you can have for this, but a lot of it just comes down to what the analytical tools do and do not pick up on. Also, did I mention that traffic engineering is an extremely difficult and usually thankless job? Yeah, now I did. The point here is it's very hard for your analytical tools to tell you whether congestion in the big picture increases or decreases and by how much. But if you run all the analysis you should be running, it should make you very confident that expanding a freeway will increase VMT. And if your regional policies have climate-linked VMT reduction targets, which they should, then that's really the argument you should be making. And just like my video on exponential traffic growth, it all really points to congestion pricing. And I'll come back with an episode on that soon. Okay, before I get to the final takeaways here, just a reminder, if you're enjoying the content, drop a like and use the comment feature to let me know how your local agency accounts for or doesn't induce traffic because my impression is it's different everywhere and if you haven't subscribed already consider subscribing thanks so this was a lot and what I really hope you take away from it is two things. One, being clear with your language is important. Induced demand kind of sounds like nonsense if someone has an economics background and it can actually be interpreted as a good thing by the sort of pro-growth business types who are typically influential in City Hall. I prefer the term induced traffic just because nobody likes traffic. And two, if you're technically inclined, pay attention to how your local agencies are doing modeling and forecasting. Understand what models are good and not good at doing, and be very suspicious of anyone who presents their results with too much certainty. Forecasts almost always end up overstating the benefits of capacity projects, and in particular, if they're not accounting for all five potential sources of induced traffic, then it's time to start asking questions. Finally, watch out for DOTs that keep two sets of books for their analysis. You'd like to think this doesn't happen, but they might have an analysis that shows lower VMT and emissions in an environmental report. 
And then they'll turn around and tell the freight community and the pro-growth business types that they're actually increasing vehicle throughput. That doesn't really add up, so if you see it, again, ask questions. And that's all I've got. Keep the great suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.